Chapter 6 Crowded House Natalie's third baby was born in the back seat of an old Chevy on the way to the nearest hospital. He was named Glenn after Bradley's astronaut hero, which made Bradley proud enough to overcome his shyness and tell the kids at school. Glenn had a rough start. Bradley had overheard his parents talking about a recent doctor's appointment, during which they were told Glenn's health issues were because Natalie drank too much. Mo swore terribly about the doctor, but now he was strutting around like a king rooster, making phone calls to spread the news. Hey, shoo, this is Mo. I got me another boy, he said on the phone. And he's all mine. He's good looking too, damn it. That makes me proud. He took another swig out of his bottle of spirits, got up and stretched his arms to the ceiling. Bradley heard the joints in his back pop, followed by a sharp grunt. Yeah, Friday after work, I'm out of here. See you then, partner. Mo hung up the phone and walked over to Bradley, who was building a jet plane out of a Legos. He tried to rough up Bradley's hair, only to misjudge his own booze-fueled strength and knock him over onto his side. Bradley looked up at his tall, drunk, and scary father, wishing he would go away. You and those goddamn Legos, what you doing? You gonna build yourself an airplane and fly away? Where's your mom anyway? She was in the back room breastfeeding Glenn. The only reason Bradley was inside the house braving his drunk father was to catch a look at his new baby brother. Mo's voice boomed from the bedroom. Damn, give me some of that. That's some fine stuff. There's one for each of you, his mom said. Then the oohs and ahs started up, and Bradley knew he wasn't going to see Glenn yet. He gathered his Legos and went outside. After a while, he heard, Ouch! Through the window, and his mom's voice say, The doctor said six weeks. Mo growled. You tell that doctor he doesn't know what a man's needs and tell him I'm gonna put a boot up his ass. Natalie quieted down and Bradley worked on his Legos, imagining the feeling of flying a jet when it broke the sound barrier over his neighborhood. Boom! On Friday, Mo came home just long enough to peel off his dirty clothes, talk how much he hated his job, and take a shower. Then he dressed and went out to meet Shu. The next day, Natalie tried to explain to the boys that Mo had to work out of town for a while. But weeks went by and he didn't come home. Eventually, Natalie stopped getting up and started staying in bed for days. And the bedroom started smelling like urine. The food ran out. And Bradley couldn't help but call Grandma Mary, even though Mom had said never to bother. Grandma came over with some bags of groceries. And the first thing she did was bottle feed Glenn. After that, she made food for Bradley and Jeffrey. Fried pancakes with canned beans or corn mixed into the batter. She swore about Shu, Mo, and Natalie the whole time and even said bad things about the government. Then she started cleaning around the kitchen, drinking from a bottle of booze and swearing about that too. Her speech got slurred, and she told Bradley and Jeffrey their father was a crook who got caught breaking into a pawn shop and stealing, that he was back in jail, and that it was all because of that bastard shoe who had planned the whole thing. Natalie went to the hospital for almost two weeks and came home feeling better. She enjoyed people's reactions when she told them they gave her electroshock treatments and made sure to tell everybody. Her stories gave Bradley nightmares of his mom lying on a table with wires sticking out of her head, her eyes bugging out while her brain got fried by high-voltage electricity. While she was in the hospital, they found out she was pregnant again, and Grandma Mary swore terribly about that. As soon as Natalie started in on the house chores and making the boys a meal, the old lady went back to her house across town. With the new baby needing so many things, there wasn't enough money to pay the rent and the sheriff fondly brought an eviction notice. One day, Bradley came home from school to find all their stuff out on the front yard. A police car was nearby watching over everything. Grandma Mary's cousin, Sam, was there with a pickup truck loading things to take them to Grandma's. Heart pounding in his throat, fists clenched, Bradley took a strong breath and bit down hard to keep tears back. He walked straight up to his mom, raised his arms in the air, and in a loud whine said, Mom! Please, don't have any more babies. She took a long drag on her cigarette, looked down at him with one eye closed and said, (sighs) There was nothing in the world that could love her more than a brand new baby, and she needed all the love she could get. Natalie named her fourth baby Samuel after the books in the Old Testament. Bradley didn't understand why his mother would name a baby after a book in the Bible. Maybe it would give him special power and make his life easier. The day for the third graders' reading card session was balmy. 
The school had acquired the student reading laboratory cards earlier that year. They sat in a box on a table in the back corner of the classroom. The stories had bored Bradley, placing him at the brown reading level, which was a year behind where he should be. The kids got in line at the reading box and started picking their cards for the day. Scott, who always made A's, stood in front of Bradley and chose a blue card. Bradley looked more closely at the box. He looked at all the colors and what order they were in. Another kid picked a green card, and it hit him so hard he felt the air go out of his chest. They're all smarter than me. He forgot all about the A-plus he had made on his assignment. He was reading from the back of the box, and those kids were closer to the front. They must think they were better than him. Mrs. Finchbow must like them more. His hand squeezed into fists, and a tight knot formed in his stomach. When it was his turn, he reached for a green card. His hand was shaking, and he fumbled it, but he got it. He grabbed a score sheet and marched to his desk. It was hard to read the green level story. There were more words, and some of them he didn't understand. His nose wrinkled with concentration, and he felt itchy all over. Before he could finish it, Mrs. Finchbow was at his desk, holding a tan card. Here, Bradley, try this one. If you make perfect scores, you can go to the green level later. She was taking great care not to embarrass him in front of the class. Okay, I will. The tan card was easier. With his heart racing, he stared at every word, trying to remember all of them, as though doing so would save his life. Then he answered the questions on the score sheet for the first tan story and made 100%. Mrs. Finchbow shouldn't have, but she decided that Bradley was special, and the following Friday, she let him go to the green cards. He burned with concentration, reading the cards over and over until the time was up. It took him three weeks to get a 100% on a story at that level, but then he went to Aqua. By the time he reached Blue, the highest kid was at Violet, which was a year ahead. Bradley asked his teacher for more time to read the cards, but she had another suggestion. You have the reading cards under control, Bradley. There's only so much you can learn from them. Just keep doing them the way you are. The school had a little library, and she took him there and found a couple of books he might like. Here, Bradley, take these home and read them, and go as fast as you can. The reading cards will be easier, and you'll get ahead. Bradley read as much as he could at home. He read while his siblings were crying or throwing things. He read while Natalie made pots of spaghetti or Spanish rice out of a box. He read while Mo watched the fights on TV and got drunk. He read in a closet with a flashlight while his parents screamed at each other in the middle of the night. Jeffrey watched Bradley and wanted to be smart like him, so he started reading Bradley's books. Soon, Natalie started telling people that Jeffrey was the smartest kid in kindergarten. I don't have the slightest idea how that could happen, she would add. One evening in late January 1967, Natalie threw open the door to the bedroom where nine-year-old Bradley was holed up with an Isaac Asimov story about positronic robot brains. Bradley, come see the news. He shook himself out of the story and obeyed. On TV, he watched a tragedy unfold. The Apollo 1 space capsule had burned up on the launch pad, and the astronauts inside had been burned alive. Bradley froze, breathless, trying to make sense of it. They showed the capsule with black burn marks on it. Mom, how could this happen? I'm so sorry, honey. I know they were your heroes. Don't worry. They'll make another one, and there will be more astronauts to fly to the moon. She sounded sincere and placed a hand on his shoulder. Bradley stood and stared at the TV until it cut to a commercial. Okay. He was struggling to breathe. He shuffled to the bathroom and locked himself in, gasping and heaving big sobs. He turned the faucet on at the sink and flushed the toilet to cover the sounds of his breakdown, tears streaming down his cheeks. He tried hard to stop, not wanting his mom, or especially his dad who sat nodding in front of the TV to hear. If his father caught him crying, he would whip his sissy ass real good. Bradley's faith in the space program was renewed by a field trip to the California Science Center the following year, where there was a mock-up Apollo command module exhibit. There were already other astronauts training for the first manned Apollo mission. He couldn't wait to see the three-man capsule. And when the group walked closer to it, he broke rank, running up the steel stairway to the capsule window. The capsule looked smaller than he remembered from TV. It must be miniature. Hey, mister, he yelled at a docent. It was very unlike Bradley to raise his voice, especially at a stranger. But he was driven mad by this problem of a small Apollo. Yes, son, how do you like that capsule, said the elderly gentleman. 
The class had stopped and everybody was looking up at him. Bradley, please come down now, said his fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Kulik, expecting him to follow orders immediately. Feeling a deep fear that made him clench his fist, Bradley pressed on. Is this one the real size? Yes, it's an exact copy of the real Apollo capsule. He leaned forward and shielded his eyes against the glare from a glass window. As his eyes adjusted, he could see the space where three men would have to stay for days, maybe even more than a week. That couldn't be right. Something was wrong. Terror shot through him and made him back away. The only thing keeping him from falling backward onto concrete 12 feet below was a thin guardrail. Ugh! He heard himself say, trying to breathe and not draw attention. He turned and stepped down the stairway. Bradley, stay with the group, his teacher ordered, or you'll have to go sit in the bus. He didn't care anymore. The space capsule made him think of triplets in a mother's womb, all wiggling around, wanting to come out. He could never go into space crammed in like that. He watched the rest of the tour from the back of the group, head down, putting one foot in front of the other, feeling like one of Asimov's robots. He would never be an astronaut.